TV. The world is thinking. Good evening and welcome to the first in what I hope will be many annual lectures delivered by the most prominent critics in the Academy today. I am Andre Asseman, I'm the chair of the PhD program in comparative literature, and it is my pleasure to host this event tonight and to see such a full house. Let me quickly remind everyone of two items of business. One, tonight's lecture is part of part one of a two-part series of lectures. Professor Bloom will be here next week, same time, same place, on Monday the 26th. So be here if you haven't already made a reservation. Second item, the dreaded cell phones. Please turn those off. Am I the only person who's freezing in here? Is it cold? Yes. Can, can it be turned down a little? What? We're raising the temperature. What? They're raising the temperature. Thank you. Okay. Old people get very cold very easily. I said this is the first in a series of annual lectures to be delivered by a prominent critic. I was understating two facts. The first is the word prominent. I should have said preeminent, for our speaker tonight is not one among great critics. He is the critic par excellence. The second understatement is a bit more complicated. We did not want a lecture by a preeminent critic. We wanted a lecture by a preeminent critic who would not mind, maybe, talking about himself <coughs> as, ex as elusively and as obliquely as he wished to do, and to tell us about his way of thinking. Because the question is, what does a critic bring to a text that no one had brought to it before? How does a critic read, or to use a more appropriate term tonight, how does a critic misread? One could push the envelope strongly, further. Strongly. <laughs> One could push the envelope further and ask a more difficult question, namely, what is it that a critic projects on a text in order to read and understand that text? We want to know. The next generation of scholars needs to know our PhD program in comparative literature here at the Graduate Center is currently trying to propose the creation of a certificate program in critical theory. Our students are fully aware that in today's academy, an insular, belletristic scholar needs to be trained in theory or at least apprised of what the best and sometimes the wonkiest literary theoreticians are up to. Our students need to read Cervantes, Proust, Melville, and Shakespeare, but they must also read Kojev, Merleau-Ponty, and if you really must, Walter Benjamin. I won't name others because I'm sure there'll be an uproar. Suffice it to say that we are an equal opportunity department and it's totally 50-50. A great critic teaches us how to read. That is, how to read all over again. You thought you knew a text. After hearing a great critic, you realize that you had barely scratched its surface. But there is nothing else than a great critic teaches, and it's perhaps something simpler and hence more difficult yet, how to find what makes a work sublime. Because art, however you come by to, come by to it, is ultimately about poetry. In good post-realist fashion, we all wish to believe that poetry is about life and nothing but life. But lo and behold, what if we invert the terms and begin to see that poetry is not about life, but that the best of life is always and has always been about the love and the longing to find poetry in our lives. Without poetry, what's left? Two final words of business. I want to take a moment to thank President William Kelly of the Graduate Center for his support of this lecture tonight. I also want to take another moment to thank my staunch benefactors, David and Goldie Blankstein, sitting there. Without your goodwill, your trust, your generosity, and your kindness, this room tonight would be empty.
Now, before I leave, I want to give the podium to someone who needs no introduction and who will introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Sam Tannenhaus. Sam Tannenhaus is, as we all know, the editor of the New York Times Book Review, that organ of the Times that determines what America reads and whether a book floats or sinks or sometimes happens, barely swims to the shore. Sam is the author himself of many books, among them a biography of Whitaker Chambers, and most recently, The Death of Conservatives. When last year a group of students and I sat together to determine whom would we invite to give tonight's lecture, it was because we all had seen Sam's piece in, to, in tonight, of tonight's speaker that the matter bore no discussion. It made perfect sense. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Tannenhaus. <laughs> Everybody hear me? Oh, yeah, that's loud. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm not just uh, a journalist. I'm also one of many of uh, Harold Bloom's students. I studied with him at Yale in the late 1970s. And for those of you who are most familiar with Professor Bloom's works in defense of the Western canon and the, the great uh, masterpiece on Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, it's useful to know, and some people in the audience will, that at the time I studied uh, with Professor Bloom, he was the great radical in American criticism. Um, he was the author of a book called The Anxiety of Influence, published in 1973, although you'll know in uh, Harold's most recent book, the one I reviewed, uh, The Anatomy of Influence, that it was actually an idea that had occurred to him as early as 1967, and it sen essentially revolutionized um, the subjects Andre is talking about, which is the understanding of poetry. And Harold will talk about that, I'm sure, in connection with uh, the great Walt Whitman. I'll just say a couple of things about it. Um, the assumption for centuries <coughs> had been that poets were apprentices to the great predecessors they read and learned from. If you were a poet in the 19th century, then you read Shakespeare and Milton and um, maybe some of the early romantic poets. And if you were a great poet in the 20th century, you read the 19th century poets and learned from them and you were their benign students. And Harold took that idea, drawing on so many sources it would take this entire evening just to list them, from the ancients through modern uh, thinkers like Freud and Nietzsche, turned the idea around and said the relationship between a later poet and an earlier poet was, put it very crudely, like that of a parent and a, ch and a child. That is fraught with tension, anxiety, even at times a kind of hostility, and then at the end a great <clears throat> resolution and the greatest writers, poets, also novelists, as he went on to explore in later works, actually in some ways internalized in a very combative way the great works that had preceded them and found their own way to be original. And as Andre said, to hear and read Harold Bloom elaborating on this remarkable discovery was to read in an utterly different way. It's probably the most essential transformation that happened in the modern understanding of literature. But Harold also has his great precursors, as he would call them, and I'll mention just three tonight. That is, other great scholar critics who also were readers in the world. One of them is the great Dr. Johnson, who in many ways I think Harold would say is his truest forerunner or precursor. And I'll mention two others. Uh, one is Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in, a, in essence created the romantic idea of transcendence that the great Walt Whitman then found poetic means for expressing. And the third may seem strange, but I think in some ways is the closest uh, to the great Professor Bloom, and that's Oscar Wilde, and Wilde wrote a brilliant, brilliant essay called The Critic is Artist, and this is what Harold became in our time. He's, he's a scholar, as Andre said, it's true. He's a critic. He's also one of the great literary artists of our time. That's why he's won every award you can imagine, except the Nobel Prize, and that may be waiting for him. 
Um, he's been a MacArthur Fellow. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is the kind of critic that poets and novelists read more closely than they read their fellow so-called creative writers, because his creative spirit in many ways encompasses theirs. So it's a great privilege to introduce, as Andre says, the critic, the scholar, the great reader of our time, the great Professor Harold Bloom. Okay. I love you too. <laughs> Not <from Dad. laughs> that sublimely generous overpraise we will set aside. <laughs> what there? I'm not talking, oh, the, oh I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I'm, is that all right? Uh, okay. Um, I hate microphones, but my voice, <clears throat> going on 82, my voice is not what it was in my, I suppose I could call it my subprime. Um, <laughs> Uh, this lecture on Whitman is called Improving Opinion into Knowledge. My lifelong critical hero, Samuel Johnson, taught me to value biography over history, even as I endlessly emulate his veracity at devouring histories. Emerson, a later ideal, said there is no history, only biography. Johnson thought we owed everything to Shakespeare, for where else can the commonwealth of imagination turn? The labor of the authentic critic, Johnson reflected, improved opinion into knowledge. He did not need to ask, what precisely is literary knowledge? We arrived later, and I think we are morosely a little skeptical of what can be known and what Borges would have called the living labyrinth of literature. Sequentially, the greatest literature is more a pageant than a history. I think I wish we could see it as a kind of Baroque dramatic celebration, spectacular alike for its pomp and its covert achieved anxiety a sort of mystery play with the disciplined imagination as perpetually dying God. Literary critics avoid pomp lest they be seen as pompous. The three inventors of criticism were Aristophanes, Aristotle, and the pseudo Longinus, who was acclaimed by one of my scholarly heroes, Ernst Robert Cortius, as the inaugural literary critic. Aristotle had, in fact, his lyrical aspect, and I agree with Heinrich Heine that there is a god, and his name is Aristophanes, <laughs> who visited divine wrath upon Euripides for daring to challenge Aeschylus. Myself, a Longinian critic since early youth, I rejoice at all strong transports of sublimity from Aeschylus and the first Isaiah through Shakespeare and Milton, <coughs> onto Helderlin, Leopardi, Shelley. Longinus found the sublime in Moses and Sappho, delightful bedfellows. <laughs> and I emulate him by obeying Shelley's observation. The function of the sublime is to persuade us to end the slavery of pleasure. <laughs> Etymologically, the word pageant goes back to the medieval mystery play. Lord Byron marches his heart's pageant across Italy and Greece, hoping for the pomp of death and battle, proper for a descendant of the royal Stuarts of Scotland. That was on his mother's side. His mystery play, Cain, for me at least, holds up splendidly. Though once I was offered a performance in my honor at an Athenian amphitheater, and rather sadly had to judge it as just plain unplayable. I read and teach Whitman's Song of Myself as a mystery play, Walt palpably playing the Christ. Together with Moby Dick, it is the sublime of American imaginative literature, yet I would not desire either work to be mounted <coughs> upon a stage, 
except as pageants, spectacular celebrations, positive and negative, of our American sublime. I think of Whitman and Melville and their relation to our unfortunately contemporary United States as our resource akin to Isaiah's prophecy, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and as a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. We have a need to heal violence, whether from without or from within. Our strongest writers, in my judgment, Emerson, Whitman, Melville, Emily Dickinson, Henry James, Wallace Stevens, Hart Crane, Faulkner, among others, can meet that imaginative poverty and help protect the individual mind and society from themselves. I now have come to see that as the highest use of literature for life. I never question myself as to why I constantly reread, teach, and write about Shakespeare. There is no God but God, and his name is William Shakespeare. It's the most religious formulation I'm capable of. <laughs> Whereas I wonder incessantly why Walt Whitman has been an obsession for me ever since I suffered a rather dreadful middle of the journey crisis in 1965 now almost a half century ago. <clears throat> the indubitable aesthetic eminence of Whitman in itself does not provide an answer, more even than Emerson and Melville, Hawthorne and Henry James, Hart Crane and Faulkner, Walter's our gift to world literature. He is the poem of our climate, and yet the mystery of his fascination still puzzles me. <clears throat> My mentor and friend, much missed by me, Kenneth Burke, chuckled when I first brought this up to him sometime in the 1980s. Harold, he remarked, Walt has hold of you precisely because you don't write poems. I could not follow Kenneth then and still am baffled. <laughs> Burke composed weird poems abundantly and mailed them to me in illegible batches. I have never wanted to write a poem, but only to read as many strong ones as I could apprehend. I think even as a child of nine or 10, I believe that there was a threshold that you had to cross in writing a poem. And if you weren't really worthy of it, then hungry demons would descend upon you and devour you forever. <laughs> Therefore, I have never written a poem. <laughs> and at this vast age, I certainly am not going to <coughs> Commence. Whitman summons us to be both poets and readers. Crossing Brooklyn Ferry addresses us as readers who will come later and emerge from each experience of it more confirmed in my lifelong vocation as a reader. Perhaps Kenneth meant that Whitman uniquely calls the reader in a reader into more life. <laughs> the influence of a reader's mind upon itself is not less momentous than searching for the labyrinthine ways in which that most copious of all minds, Shakespeare's, influenced itself. Fourteen consecutive months sufficed to compose King Lear, Macbeth, Antony, and Cleopatra. Quite incredible. Something abandoned Shakespeare after the furnace came up at last. I have ventured to name this inwardness, but that word is altogether insufficient. Recoiling from the abyss, the dramatist gave us Coriolanus and Timon, Leontes and Prospero, all of them light years outward <coughs> from Lear and Edgar, Macbeth and Cleopatra. <coughs> the inventor of Falstaff and of Hamlet, of Rosalind and of Iago, <coughs> is a Montaigne-like humanist but well on his winding path to nihilism. <clears throat> Beyond nihilism is the Gnostic abyss. According to the ancients, our foremother and our forefather, dwelling place of Lear, Macbeth, Cleopatra. The name for that emptiness in ancient Gnosis was the Kenoma, 
dwelling place of Timon, Coriolanus, Leontius. Prospero stands forever apart. Enchanted islands are domains not to be quarried between outwardness and inwardness. <clears throat> the reader transmembered by Hamlet becomes precursor to Macbeth's auditor and then suffers the madness of Leontes rather in the mode of William Faulkner longing for the death of Captain Ahab to be his own. <clears throat> Extraordinary sentence of Faulkner's in a letter. A sort of Golgotha of the heart become immutable as bronze in the sonority of its plunging ruin. <laughs> that catches Ahab's alienation from his crew and would fit his precursors, Hamlet and Macbeth. Leontes scrambles up out of that bronze sonority at enormous cost to himself and to others. The influence of Hamlet's devastating mind upon itself is echoed by the downward and outward effect of Macbeth's proleptic imagination upon itself. Paul Valéry was fascinated by the influence of his own mind upon Valéry, which we can read throughout his major poems. We are neither Shakespeare nor Valéry, but all of us suffer the mind's force and violence upon ourselves. <laughs> Samuel Johnson spoke of our hunger of imagination and conceded that Shakespeare alone assuaged that dangerous prevalence. Anyone who writes books for well over a half century is likely to believe that one work in particular is a neglected child. Of my own more than 40 volumes, I regard that waif as the American religion. I recall touring the American South and Southwest throughout 1986 to 91, lecturing upon American poetry while visiting whatever churches were kind enough to allow me to attend services. Many sorts of esoteric Baptists and absolutely wild Pentecostalists were warmly receptive, and so were the Mormons, though necessarily they could not admit me to their sacred temples. Brooding upon the highly original stances of Emerson, Whitman, Melville, and Emily Dickinson had been my starting point, but my wonder wandering among rather less articulate American religionists changed my way of thinking about the United States. The rise of the Tea Party did not surprise me because I had encountered its origins on my journey a quarter century before our dismal national election of 2010. I listened closely to hundreds and hundreds of American knowers who in one sense knew nothing yet in another way knew everything, because each was both the subject and the object of her or his own quest. Alone except for and with a very American Jesus, they were beyond belief, and they lived in a solitude that only the resurrected Jesus could share. <laughs> Hearing them discourse in and out of their divine assemblies taught me that the American Jesus suffers no crucifixion and experiences no ascension. Instead, he manifests himself only in the 40 days he spent with disciples after his resurrection, and for Mormons, Pentecostalists, wildly independent Baptists, having nothing to do with the fascist Southern Baptist Convention, he sojourned still in their America, walking and talking with them. Because of that, many among them told me they were already resurrected and never would die while nearly all affirmed they had heard him speak, and quite a few had seen him. The sincerity and evident amiability of so great a cloud of witnesses was equal to anything I have encountered. You don't need a third ear to apprehend such testimony, but comprehension is an ongoing quest for me still. What might be called the natural religion of our America has little to do with historical, received, European Christianity. 17th century enthusiasm mingles with discords of ancient Gnosticism and shamanistic Orphism and what I suggest we might call our native strain. What has this to do with the influence of the American critic's mind upon itself? I have learned to shrug off historicist overdeterminations because they simply cannot account for aesthetic and cognitive splendors. Their contextualizations blur more than they illuminate. Yet as readers, writers, teachers, 
our authentic context is our multitude of countrymen and women who live in a daily reality that is not at all our own. Socioeconomic reductions of their stance do not help. Marx is irrelevant to many millions of them because in America, religion is the poetry of the people, however bad, and not their opiate. Increasingly, they just do not vote their economic interests. We are far along on a route away from democracy into the morass of plutocracy. I trip over the words because they've so frightened me. Plutocracy, oligarchy, and theocracy because many millions among us live a reality completely separate from that of those in this room, for instance. The function of literary criticism at the present time cannot be to struggle with this Moby Dick of the American spirit, yet awareness of it should be part of our common ordeal of consciousness. I love Whitman's poetry and wish I could say with him, whoever you are, I place my hand upon you that you be my poem. But we cannot proclaim to another person that you be my interpretation. American religionists, when I questioned them, frequently said that falling in love was affirming again Christ's love for each of them. In such a labyrinth of idealizations, I get lost, lacking the thread that might lead to an escape. Yet if our night journey is to meet and exit, we need the poet of our climate to cut it for us. Whitman stops somewhere waiting for us. Walt sings of what he hears and sees more often than of what he knows, but his proclamations of knowledge are overwhelming. Failing to fetch me, at first keep encouraged. Missing me, one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Authority is sanctioned here, not least by the breathtaking descent beneath what you or I would regard as the bottom limits of being this extraordinary, utterly Whitmanian line and mossy scales of the worm fence and heaped stones and elder and pokeweed. How can I improve my opinion regarding that sanctioning into knowledge? One thinks of Samuel Beckett, ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Walt failed better. Song of Myself Like Heart Cranes the Bridge fails only as American epic gives a new meaning to failure. Melville's Ahab fails in his quest, so does Huckleberry Finn, if American heroic quest be judged by old world criteria. American literary criticism, be it Emerson or Kenneth Burke, is a new mode that is on vacation from the work of interpretation. It may fail, but no matter, it will try again. I am slicing away at this as I don't intend to keep us in this cold too long. (laughs) (laughs) You need to love a poet and poem before your appreciation can transcend the accidents of your own nature. Since this is a lecture, I need a brief text and choose one of the rare late returns of Walt's genius, The Dalliance of the Eagles, composed in 1880 when the poet was 60. He had never seen eagles mate and relied on a description given him by his friend, the great naturalist John Burroughs. <laughs> Skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest, sky with an air, a sudden muffled sound, the dalliance of the eagles, the rushing amorous contact high in space together, the clenching, interlocking claws, a living, fierce, gyrating wheel, four beating wings, two beaks, a swirling mass, tight grappling, in tumbling, turning, clustering loops, straight downward falling, to all the river poised, the twain yet one, a moment's law, a motionless, still moment in the air, then parting, talons loosing, upward again on slow, firm pinions slanting, their separate, diverse flight, she, hers, he, his, pursuing. An astonishing vision in just 90 words. I prefer this to Gerard Manley Hopkins, Hopkins's The Windover and W.B. Yeats's Later on the Swan, both of them experimental sonnets. 
Hopkins loved and feared Whitman, while Yates rather nastily disliked the American upstart, dismissed in a vision with rather weak misunderstanding. Hopkins, writing to Robert Bridges in 1882, remarks, I always knew in my heart Walt Whitman's mind to be more like my own than any other man's living, as he is a very great scoundrel. This is not a pleasant confession, and this makes me all the more anxious to read him and the more determined that I will not. To describe the ministering angel of the Washington, D.C. Civil War hospitals as close to an authentic American saint as we will ever know. To describe Walt as a very great scoundrel is a bit breathtaking, yet the textual evidence of Father Hopkins's own poems indicates a much wider and deeper reading in Whitman than he ever was willing to acknowledge. Walt's verbs, like his erotic attachments, are largely intransitive. That is to say, they either cannot find or in fact could not have an object. Indeed, they tend towards adverbial status. In the dalliance of the eagles you confront, and you must forgive this list, Skirting, rushing, clenching, interlocking, living, beating, swirling, grappling, tumbling, turning, clustering, falling. I won't go through them all. They go on and on and on. That makes 18 verbal forms, all but one intransitive. One-fifth of this fierce lyric's words mount together into what seems desire without an object, though the coupling that is the poem describes a mutual passion fulfilled. My longest friend and perpetual critical mentor still alive, Angus Fletcher. We have been close friends now for 60 years. Angus observed that to read Whitman aright, we have to remain perpetually intransitive. Like the vast majority of his middle voicing verbs, his verbs of sensation, perception, cognition, my friendship with Fletcher leads me to call that the Fletcher Principle and to apply it also to Dante, Shakespeare, Shelley, Hart Crane, and other great poets. As a teacher, I urge myself and others to remain perpetually intransitive, like the Jesus of the very Walt Whitmanian Gnostic Gospel of Thomas who proclaims to us almost as though he is Walt, be passers-by. Walt always is passing us by, waiting somewhere up ahead. This evasion ought to be at odds with his shocking, startling immediacy, yet fuses with it. Any strong poem, whether by Hopkins or Yeats, Elizabeth Bishop or, I wish you were here tonight, my dear friend John Ashbery, eludes our drive to objectify it. And Whitman is no more ill-assorted than his compeers. At 81, I wonder why poems in particular obsessed me from my childhood onwards. A dreadfully over-emotional sensibility, I tended to need more affection from my parents and sisters than even they could possibly sustain. From the age of 10 onwards, I sought from the great Yiddish poet Moshe Leib Halpern and from Hart Crane, from Shakespeare and from Shelley, the strong affect I seemed to always need from answering voices. The dalliance of the eagles finds me by its only apparent refusal of affect. The poem hesitates between its vista of emotionless still balance in the air and subsequent separate diverse flight. Walt only rarely stands still, yet hesitation as his disciple, a friend I still mourn and lament, Archie Randolph Ammons wrote, hesitation has its own rewards. The intransitive verb hesitate is related to the Latin for holding fast. <laughs> Whitman's motionless still balance in the air. We do not think of Walt as we recite this poem. What it celebrates and sings is not myself, but the Lucretian rerum natura, the way things are. Though implicit, magnificent remains its burden. We see in here not the American sublime, but a particular encounter vividly represented for its own sake. John Ruskin greatly admired Whitman's powers, but he feared that the poems were compromised by excessive personality. I think he would have made an exception for this strenuously impressionistic vista where the personality of Walt Whitman, one of the roughs in American, conspicuously is absent. No poem, Paul Valéry remarked, is ever finished. Rather, the poet abandons it. That certainly is 
Whitman's customary proxies, and so the dalliance of the eagle must be a sport. Yet Whitman's art intimates that both the dalliance and its representations are fragments torn from that one great astonishing trope, leaves of grass, and here I will omit again. As a mixed trope, leaves of grass is virtually inexhaustible. Raised as a Bible reading Quaker and a follower of the circuit riding dissident Elias Hicks, extraordinary man Hicks, half black, half Native American, at my age, still circuit riding. Walt remembered the transmutation of a great trope from Isaiah in the first epistle of Peter. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. With this, Whitman compounded the fiction of the leaves, Homer analogizing the generations of leaves to those of humankind, Virgil's recently dead souls troped as autumnal leaves humanized by the stretching forth of their hands longing for the farthest shore of the living, Dante's damned souls falling away over the dark water as the autumnal leaves fall. The later developments of this image are transhumed in Whitman's title. I need a greater text than the dalliance of the eagles, and I give Walt at his very grandest and song of myself. A child said, what is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. Yet this is not Walt, but old Bloom. Suddenly, having said he doesn't know it, it gives you this extraordinary series of visions. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrance are designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corner that we may see and remark and say, whose? Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic and it means spreading alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white. <laughs> Tuckahoo, Congressman Cuff, I give them the same, I receive them the same. And then that stunning line, and now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them. It may be you are from old people or from offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps. And here you are the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. <coughs> How convert my total ravishment by this into knowledge? <laughs> An Epicurean materialist, and not at all a transcendentalist, once he'd gotten over his initial Emersonianism, <coughs> Whitman believes that the what is unknowable and denies that he is the answerer. Yet his figurative guesses are what Wallace Stevens would have called floribundant. The green flag of his hopeful disposition, God's flirtatious handkerchief, the babe of nature, and best of all, the most Homeric of American similes, the beautiful uncut hair of graves. <coughs> Going to fix your mic. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <coughs> My gestures. <coughs> A histrionic old rascal. <laughs> the, the, the homoerotic tenderness that follows modulates harmoniously into the laps of mothers and then mounts into a biblical solemnity in a passage Hemingway must have pondered since his style is both anticip anticipated and I would think surpassed by it. <coughs> this grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers. The grass, very dark, darker, dark to come, all but blackens in this vista. In 1855, Walt has gone ahead of any surrealism and indeed stopped somewhere waiting for it too. Steer at a flourishing meadow, 
with Whitman in mind and contemplate the beautiful uncut hair of old mothers in a kaleidoscope or riot of colors, green, black, white, a white not the colorless or color of Melville's whiteness of the whale, but redemptive because its life is ongoing. Knowledge of and in Whitman at his flood tide is authenticated by a, as he beautifully puts it, me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns. How can the critical receiver convert those returns to her own? I read Walt and become struck by wonder, as when I read Shakespeare. Walt sustains the comparison as Cervantes does, and perhaps only a few others. Shakespeare birthed scores of people, Cervantes but two, Whitman only the one, but Sancho, the sorrowful knight, and Walt are among the other living. Knowing Sancho, Falstaff, or Walt is hardly an opinion. It is seeing face to face. If I say Walt knows me face to face as I do him, is that a critical turn or metaphor still? Figuration is involved. You and I, like Whitman, wish to be taken literally, but alas, we all have to be taken figuratively. Walt cries out to embrace and be embraced, but I think, alas, in the sadness of reality, all of his couplings were intransitive. A century and a half after his heroic hospital service, Walt is American legend, our unanointed redeemer figure. I must break in on myself to tell an anecdote. You may have noticed we have no Walt Whitman post office stamp. This is because of that magnificent person, Senator Trent Lott of Mississippi. <laughs> when it was proposed that Walt receive such a stamp, he rose on the floor of the Senate to announce that it was widely known that Walt Whitman was homosexual and that doctors had proved that homosexuality was a form of kleptomania. <laughs> I wrote him a letter, the only time I've written a letter to a public official, urging him to visit a mental alienist himself, <laughs> but I still await my reply. <laughs> I'm sorry, where was I? I shouldn't do this sort of thing. Uh, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Uh, I shouldn't do that. Well, here, here we are, here we are. I'm sorry. Transvaluation of old world Christianity is absolute in Whitman, even as it really rather wavers in Melville. Lincoln was assassinated on Good Friday, which prompts a poem in Melville's battle pieces, but drum taps and sequel culminates in the Lilacs elegy, where all Christian ritual very deliberately and rigorously is absolutely excluded. Is the release of enormous energy and ambition akin to the conversion of opinion into knowledge? One thinks of the occult vitalism of Balzac and of the surge that is Pickwick Papers. Leaves of Grass, 1855, contemporary with Balzac and Dickens, is matched only by Moby Dick as the new world's explosion into a mode of what I suppose you would call solar, S-O-L-A-R, cognition. The American difference is in Whitman's and even in Melville's immediacy. A critic's knowledge in my own limited experience is a kind of gnosis, an Alexandrian mode in which the knower also is known. Self-awareness in Montaigne's tradition becomes secular gnosis in Paul Valéry, who declined to separate the aesthetic from any other mode of consciousness. All modes of knowledge fuse in the typical Valerian poem at its strongest. It is perhaps lunatic of me to go on juxtaposing Whitman and Valerie, but I have a beast in view. Remember that marvelous uh, little thing that Dryden writes on the turn from the 17th into the 18th century? I thought of it in 2000 and 2001, all, all of a piece throughout. Thy chase had a beast in view. Thy wars brought nothing about. Thy lovers proved all untrue. <laughs> 
Tis well an old age is out and time to begin anew. Which didn't happen, of course, in 2001. <clears throat> I've lost myself again. I, old people are hopelessly digressive. And, <laughs> and, uh, composing prose poems, Valerie, the great French master, felt again an angel's weariness and quested for the source of intellectual desire in his first conscious apprehension of the world. Whitman, in his stunning 1855 long poem, belatedly termed The Sleepers, makes much the same night journey into the abyss of the mind. Emerson and Nietzsche, Whitman and Valerie deprecated mere memory and what Valerie called its tiresome prolongation of ancient enmities and resentments, of systems that are the mind's violence against itself. Famously, Valerie remarked, and I love this, reading is a military operation. Whitman certainly was not a poet of young fates or of cemeteries by the sea, but I would argue that his formalism, with a capital F, exceeded Valerie's precisely because he was the stronger poet of the two, wonderful as Valerie was. Wallace Stevens might have scoffed at my contention, yet it is not Valerie who swims just beneath the surface of Stevens' greater poems and rises up to break through when he is not summoned. I think also of the magnificent vision of Walt in which Stevens surpassed even Lorca and Hart Crane. Extraordinary outburst. In the far south, the sun of autumn is passing like Walt Whitman walking along a ruddy shore. He is singing and chanting the things that are part of him, death and day. Nothing is final, he chants. No man shall see thee. And his beard is a fire, and his staff is a leaping flame. I'm sorry. I hate microphones. At once, Yahweh, Moses, and Aaron, the American bard, proclaims against finalities. Try to conceive of Stevens envisioning Paul Valerie striding upon the heights of the graveyard by the sea, blindingly staring at its undulations pitched between vacuous mortality and fiery space and unendurable earlessness. The Gallic seer regards the sun of the south suspended at noon. Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, an American, beholds in the far south the sun of autumn passing while he walks by the water's edge singing and chanting death and day, intimate partitions of his own consciousness. So deep is the poetic mind of Wallace Stevens that he has placed Valerie and Whitman in a giant agon that the French child of Malamé and Rambeau of Baudelaire cannot win. Go down to the waterline and you are in Walt's domain where only he can triumph. Yet where am I, worn out ancient exegete, indeed, called ancient exegete, in this conflagration of three great poets, all the splendors of the marine cemetery out of the cradle endlessly rocking the auroras of autumn depend upon their finding me. Valerie and Stevens help form my critical mind, and yet the presence of Walt Whitman overwhelms me, possesses me, as only a few others, Dante, Shakespeare, Milton, consistently flood my entire being. What Leo Spitzer called clicks as he reads in Old Bloom becomes a transport to the sublime. Without vision, I think criticism perishes. The American sublime, a precarious mode, even when opening to glory in the age of Emerson, seems a mockery in 2012. Yet Emerson spoke of the great and vital self, and Whitman manifested it with what I find to be a touchstone for American sublimity. Lines so quiet that I wish I could speak them with the appropriate hush. So plain, they are so plain and yet so wonderful. In the dooryard, fronting an old farmhouse near the whitewashed palings, stands the lilac bush, tall growing, with heart shaped leaves of rich green, with many a pointed blossom rising delicate, with the perfume strong I love. <laughs> 
with every leaf a miracle. And from this bush in the dooryard with delicate colored blossoms and heart-shaped leaves of rich green, a sprig with its flower I break. Six lines of what I want to call plain radiance find their only transitive verb in the very last word, break. Walt breaks the tally, T-A-L-L-Y, his defining trope, and the sprig of lilac he will throw upon Lincoln's funeral cortege as it slowly departs Union Station, Washington, D.C., to begin its long trek through many cities to rest at last in Springfield, Illinois. Inevitable phrasing, my criterion for the highest poetry since my early childhood, is a very difficult matter for criticism to expound, since inevitably here is itself a trope dependent upon aesthetic experience. In very old age, I begin to believe in what might be called a poetics of pain. Memorability is heightened by suffering, which is a hard doctrine, but I find this akin to Shelley's notion that the sublime persuades us to abandon easier pleasures for more difficult ones. In this vision, the slavery of pleasure yields. Is then the inevitability for me anyway of Walt's dooryard fronting an old farmhouse in the lilac bush so commonly growing there, more of a difficult pleasure than it seems? Is my opinion that this is so an act of knowledge and in what possible sense of knowing? Is becoming wiser an act of knowledge? Nietzsche said that the greatest thoughts were the greatest actions. Thinking in and through metaphors, Shakespeare gives us persons who act with titanic self-destructiveness, incarnate sublimity, Lear, Macbeth, Hamlet, Othello, Antony. Whitman's metaphors include his hard, ordinary words, drift, passing, vista, lilac, leaf, grass, sea, star, many more. The nightingale of Keats, Shelley Skylark, are not more figurative than Whitman's mockingbird and his hermit thrush. A poet who equates his soul with the fourfold metaphor of night, death, the mother, and the sea is thinking figuratively as fiercely as did the hermeticists and the Kabbalists. Meaning to be human starts as memory of a prolific variety of pain. To inaugurate meaning, rather than merely repeat it, you cultivate an illness that is oxymoronic, a pathos that is already play. Falstaff and Walt meet in this arena and find words for what is alive in their hearts. Against trauma, we need Falstaff and Whitman, sola vitalists who abound in desire. Better than Nietzsche's Zarathustra, they realize a fresh dimension to the primordial poem of mankind, because each creates a fiction of the self that becomes a poem in our eyes. Meaning is voicing, and these images of voice become tropes of knowing. We only know what we ourselves have made, Vico proclaimed, Falstaff and Walt know the selves they have forged. I recall writing a long time ago that any new poem is rather like a little child who's been stationed with a lot of other small children in a playroom where there are a very limited number of toys and no adult supervision whatsoever. Those toys are the tricks, the turns, the tropes of poetic language. The sublime Oscar Wilde's beautiful, untrue things that save the imagination from falling, as he wonderfully says, into careless habits of accuracy. Oscar, who worshipped Walt and visited him twice during an American tour, charmingly termed criticism the only civilized form of autobiography. I have aged not a last into Oscar's wit, but into a firm conviction that true criticism has to recognize itself as a mode of memoir. Poets and critics alike seek to convert opinion into knowledge, but this means opinion in the legal and not the public sense. What is it you know when you recognize a voice? Hart Crane's extraordinary images of voice, whether a broken tower or a vaulting bridge undo my expectations after more than 70 years of reading and knowing him. At 81, I lie awake at night after first sleep and murmur Crane, Whitman, and Shakespeare to myself, seeking comfort through continuity, 
as grand voices somehow hold off the permanent darkness that gathers, though it does not fall. I take another long excursus from my own text and begin again. Walt's solitary singer does not imitate the world. I taught myself a half century ago to ask of any poem or Shakespearean drama, what precisely does this leave out to make it the beautifully expensive torso it has become? I regard the question as Kierkegaardian in the spirit of either or's rotation method, which took its delicious epigraph from Aristophanes, where a chorus chants, you get too much at last of everything, of sunsets, of cabbages, of love. Whitman hints that we get too much at last of allusiveness, yet his poetry, like all strong writing, knows better. The warding off gesture is what counts for Walt. As outsetting bard, he intimates his difference from prior celebrants of the poet's calling. Knowingly, he invents the American shore ode. The question arises, why then did Whitman choose the mockingbird when he so deftly turns aside from its characteristic agon with all rival songsters? Why is it indeed that he chooses the hermit thrush? Again, hardly a emblem for traditional poetry. Though he and Lord Tennyson admired one another and corresponded amiably, he seems to have regarded the laureate as a kind of mockingbird of genius, a greater Longfellow. And yet I hear Tennyson in the magnificent finale of the Lilacs' Lament for Lincoln. And even though I'm already running over time, I cannot resist these extraordinary lines. Yet each to keep and all Retrievements out of the night, the song, the wondrous chant of the gray-brown bird with the lustrous and drooping star with the continents full of woe, with the holders holding my hand nearing the call of the bird, comrades mine and I in the midst and their memory ever to keep for the dead I loved so well, for the sweetest, wisest soul of all my days and lands, and this for his dear sake, lilac and star and bird, Twined with the chant of my soul, there in the fragrant pines and cedars, dusk and dark. Here, as elsewhere, at his best, Whitman is a true mockingbird. Whitman's image of voice he names as the tally. Whitman, I want to sort of turn aside from this also and reach a conclusion. As I say, I, I don't want to keep us here longer and... I'm a somewhat frozen old rascal, so this will be a coda, and then we can all go home. <clears throat> how, this, how this critic thinks, what I look for, what I read, and ultimately what I project on a text is a critical method, only because I believe there is no critical method except yourself. <clears throat> As women and men of letters, we ought to share in a vision in which the highest literature simply becomes our way of life. Whitman had no poetic method except his self, though I should say self, since there are three of him. Myself, Walt Whitman, one of the roughs in American, and also the real me or me myself, and nearly unknowable my soul. His vision was what he called democratic vistas, and here again I need my old friend Kenneth Burke, who suggested that Whitmanian vistas are future possibilities, results to come through the spiritualization of our nation's wealth. Imagine Walt contemplating Mitt Romney's spiritualization of his wealth, and you can be thankful that our national poet who suffered the first gilded age is not here to experience our even more vicious second one. That excursus merely brings the rough Walt up to date, though I cannot perform the conjuring channels to Whitman that so many great poets have. The point of view for my life's work as a literary critic, such as it was and is, and perhaps for a little while longer maybe founds itself upon the Whitmanian vista and on the Falstaffian vitalism, both of them beyond me yet beckoning on as the blessing, which I translate as meaning more life into a time without boundaries. This has to be, and the difficulty of what it is to be,
Emerson once remarked, that which we are, that only can we see. At 81, I see by glimpses, yet behold feelingly. Only authentic painters, composers, writers, sculptors can improve their beholdings into knowledge. Samuel Johnson thought genuine critics also could improve opinions into knowledge. Much depends on our belatedness upon persuasively redefining opinion. I cannot, with Nietzsche and with Walter Pater, whom I adore, believe that life only might be appreciated as an aesthetic phenomenon. But I wish I could believe that, and perhaps only Judaic tradition totally blocks me from it. Wisdom needs to be added to aesthetic splendor and cognitive power as the three stigmata or criteria of knowledge or value. But where except in Shakespeare are all three to be discovered consistently. And yet Nietzsche, who quarries so much out of Prince Hamlet without perhaps knowing it, Nietzsche as educator is beyond just another Dionysian enlightener. He is a genealogist of the imagination similar to Kierkegaard as a master of repetition. The wish to transfigure the trauma of forgetting is contaminated by redemption theology in Kierkegaard, but not in Nietzsche, who urges us, just take one step more and forgive yourself everything, so that the drama of fallen redemption will be enacted in your own soul. Nietzsche is not the fountain of our will, Waldo Emerson is. The sage of Concord taught that voice, not text, is America's mode of self-knowing. Walt Whitman, telling his sonorous image of voice, fulfills Emerson as Nietzsche's Zarathustra could not. Walt is for me the American difference, which I keep attempting to improve into knowledge. Thank you very much. <laughs>